I've been talking about the hidden psychological motives of skepticism and atheism and making the point that these ideologies, these ways of thinking are appealing because they help people to avoid moral accountability. And Christianity, I want to emphasize, is in fact a religion that demands a certain degree of moral accountability. Now, some people say, well, no, Dinesh, Christianity is about love, it's about forgiveness, it's about, well, it is. But let's remember that the love and forgiveness are temporal, which is to say that they apply to this life. And they're also, to a point, conditional. Um, Christian forgiveness stops at the gates of hell, and hell is an essential part of the Christian scheme. So while the Gospels talk about the good news, the books also contain a lot of warning messages to prepare us for ultimate judgment. There is a reckoning, and Scripture says that many people are extremely eager to avoid that reckoning. Listen to this, John 3.20, Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So right here you have the heart of what I've been trying to show, which is that if you don't like the light, you're going to want to deny its existence. You're going to want to say, hey, no, darkness is all we have. We have to live in the darkness because that's all there is. And you're not making an objective statement about reality. You're, you're making a psychological statement about the way things, the way you want things to be. So the point here is not that atheists are evil people, that they do more evil than everybody else. My point is that atheism provides a kind of hiding place for those who don't want to acknowledge and repent of their sins. I remember, gosh, now, I guess a couple of decades ago, I read a powerful essay by the Czech um, Nobel laureate, and his name is Czeslaw um, uh, Milos, Czeslaw Milos. And the essay was called The Discreet Charm of Nihilism. What an interesting title. Nihilism itself has a certain kind of charm. Now, what does he argue? He argues that in order to escape from an eternal fate in which our sins are punished, man seeks to free himself from religion. And now the quote, A true opium of the people is a belief in nothingness after death. The huge solace of thinking that for our betrayals, greed, cowardice, murders, we are not going to be judged. So basically, uh, as Milosh is arguing, the Marxist doctrine needs to be revised or actually turned on its head. Remember, Marx called religion the opium or opiate of the people, but it's not religion that's the opiate of the people, but atheism that is the opiate of the morally corrupt. Morally corrupt people like atheism because they feel like, wow, if I'm an atheist, I don't have any moral accountability. If you want to live a degenerate life, well, God is your mortal enemy. He represents a lethal danger to your selfishness, greed, lechery, hatred. It's in your interest to despise him and do whatever you can to rid the universe of his presence. And so there are powerful attractions to living in a God-free world. In such a world, we can model ourselves on Milton's Satan, or at least on one of the junior devils in Paradise Lost. This is Belial, uh, who was, as Milton puts it, quote, to vice industrious, but to nobler deeds, timorous and slothful. So this is a guy who like takes pleasure in vice and is very lazy when it comes to doing good deeds. And that's how many people are. And they these are the people who are attracted to atheism because it gives them a certain kind of moral cover or amoral cover for doing that. Think about it. If God does not exist, the seven deadly sins are not terrors to be overcome but, well, temptations to be enjoyed, and death, which was previously viewed as a justification for morality, now becomes a justification for immorality. Now, interestingly, the philosopher who understood all this was Nietzsche, and contrary to modern atheists who say, you know, the death of God doesn't mean an end of morality, Nietzsche goes, well, it does. It actually does mean that, because God is the source of the moral law. And so if God is dead, Nietzsche, of course, coined the phrase, the death of God, then God's death means that the ground has been swept out from under us. We have become, in a sense, ethically groundless. And there is no more refuge to be taken in appeals to dignity, equality, compassion, and all the rest. Because 
all that we have is the abyss, the abyss not just of God, but of morality. But, you know, unlike some other Victorians who, who saw things Nietzsche's way, but were worried by it, terrified by it. Matthew Arnold wrote his famous poem, Dover Beach, about the receding sea of faith. Nietzsche welcomed the abyss. Nietzsche was, as he described himself, an immoralist. And he says that the good thing about an abyss is that it enables us for the first time to escape guilt. Uh, it vanquishes the dragon of obligation. It enables us to live, in Nietzsche's phrase, beyond good and evil. Morality is no longer given to us from above. It now becomes something we devise for ourselves. Morality requires a comprehensive remaking, what Nietzsche calls a transvaluation of values. And the old codes of thou shall not are now replaced by I will. 